Okay, that's okay. So I am now anchored. <laughs> Not that I've got a lot of room to move anyway. But anyway, here are the people of God on the verge of the promised land. And you think, as I said, in a sense, it's going to be easy. Actually, it's not. Well, it is and it isn't. Because, what, because if they are going to achieve God's purposes, before they even start, there are some vital lessons, one of which is actually going to be literally quite painful. There are vital lessons that they've got to learn. You know the old joke, don't you, about when you put someone asking for directions on a journey and uh, they're told, oh, if I was going there, I wouldn't be starting from here. And I sense there are times when that happens and I sense, in a sense, there may be times when in the life of the church, particularly as we come out of pandemic, that we're saying, well, God's wanting us to step forward, to go forward, well, but we don't want to start from here. We've got to start from somewhere else. It's rubbish. Any journey you start has to start from exactly where you are. You need to know who you are. You need to know what you are. You need to know where you're going. And that's exactly the lessons, the crucial lessons, that the people of God had to learn before they were even ready to start to take the promised land and to fulfill God's purposes. If they were going to arrive where God intended, they had to know who they were. They've spent 40 years wandering in the desert, not knowing who they were, not knowing where they were going, apart from what you know gets fed to them from time to time from Moses and others. But what on earth was that 40 years all about? If God had redeemed us out of Egypt, why have we ended up spending all this time wandering? Of course, we know that part of it was because of their own disobedience, don't we? And God was bringing judgment on them. It's interesting that they are about to be God's means of judgment on the land of Canaan. They are about to be God's means of judgment on Canaan. And in a sense, it's almost as though they had to learn the lesson about God's judgment and God's holiness and God's wrath before they could be instruments in God's purposes. And let's not be afraid to talk about the fact that our God, who is a God of love, is also a God of justice and holiness and therefore executes judgment. It's an important part of our understanding of who, what God, who and what God is. But anyway, here they are. They've got to know who they are, they've got to know where they've come from, where they're going. And the first thing they have to learn, the, the first lesson, the, the painful lesson, is the importance of sacred ritual. There are two rituals here, circumcision and Passover, both of which are absolutely central to them knowing and understanding who they are. And particularly in terms of circumcision and this this. Um, this instruction to Joshua that, uh, that they had to be circumcised. Because they had, they wandered in the desert for 40 years and we're told that the new generation hadn't been circumcised as they should have been. Because they weren't fulfilling the function that God had intended them for. But now they were about to. Now they needed to be circumcised because circumcision was the sign of covenant relationship. Circumcision was the sign that these were God's people, separate and different from all other nations. Circumcision spoke of identity. It was the special mark of all who are descended from Abraham. Do you remember that, that when Abraham was called uh, to, uh, to be the means by which God was going to bless the nations, they were given this covenant sign. They were to circumcise the children from the age of um, eight days. Or the boys, anyway, from the age of eight, not the girls. The boys from the age of eight days. At a time where, of course, it's not painful. Very painful for grown men. 
and it's going to make them vulnerable. But that's another issue. But the first thing is that they need to recover if they're going to pro fulfill God's promises and God's purposes for coming into the land. They need, to, they need to recover a sense of identity as God's chosen people with a purpose that he has planned for them. That meant they were to be different from all other nations. They were to do everything to guard that difference. Circumcision was a reminder that they were not to intermarry with, with, the, with the people of the land that they were taking over. They were not to engage in worship of, those land, of that land's gods. They were, not to, they were not to enter into all sorts of agreements. They were to be different and separate from the surrounding nations. And of course, as the story of Israel unfolds, we know that one of the problems for Israel was because they failed to be different and all the consequences it caused for them. Circumcision was a mark of identity and they needed to know that they were God's people, called and chosen. Not because they were special, but because he loved them. What that's, what, um, that's what Moses tells them in Deuteronomy as they're about to enter the promised land. You know, God has chosen you for this purpose, to be a witness. Not because you're special. In fact, you were the least of all the people. But God loved you and chose you. And circumcision was that sign that they were identified with God's purposes. Circumcision, though, also was a sign, particularly in this situation, of dependence. The forthcoming conquest of Jericho, and ultimately the whole land, was not going to be achieved through battle. Yet there would be fighting. But if I could jump on to chapter 6 and uh, steal some of Adrian's uh, possible message from next week. A very key verse in chapter 6 is verse 7, verse 2, where the Lord says to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. All they were going to have to do was march around the place singing, waving their banners and everything else. What a daft thing to do. And did they conquer Jer Jericho with might of armies? No. God brought the walls down because God had already determined that Jericho was going to be defeated. Actually, all the Israelites had to do was simply obey what God said. It wasn't even because of their faith. God had already determined. And in fact, of course, before that, they're going to be circumcised, but it's going to leave them very, very weak for a period of time. They had to wait until they were healed. And the forthcoming conquest of Jericho and ultimately the whole land was not going to be achieved through their might in battle. Circumcision here in this situation was to remind them that it was going to be achieved in weakness and in dependence on God. They needed to know who they were in terms of that covenant relationship that they were special. They had an identity that came from God and therefore they also had to learn that they had to be dependent on him totally and utterly. They couldn't do things in their own strength. And this was going to be absolutely essential for their life when they came into the promised land. Their life was to be lived like a nut in a nutcracker. What do I mean by that? Well, I, could, well, I can't draw you a map of Israel now. because I haven't. But anyway, there's Israel there. Up there is Syria, and then later Assyria, and then later Babylon. Down here, Egypt. Big world powers. All the trade routes flow through Israel between the great world powers. And you know what happens still today. Great world powers, what influence, especially if it has to do with money and trade, don't they? And Israel was like a nut in a nutcracker between world powers. And that was the story of Israel's history, actually from the beginning to the very end, under pressure again and again and again. 
And God says, I want you to go into that land and you're going to be under pressure, but I want you to live differently as my people so that you might be a testimony to me and call the nations into, into a relationship with me. That's why they had to be different and that's why they had to do it in dependence on God. They couldn't do it in their own strength. They weren't to do it with, with political treaties and with armies and all the way that the rest of the world functioned. God, through Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy particularly, reminds them, listen, when you go into the land, I'm giving you a promise. If you go in and you trust me and you walk in relationship with me and you obey my laws and my commandments, then I make a promise and a treaty with you that I will protect you. You will not need any other form of protection. Just live differently. That was God's promise. And this circumcision was a reminder in the very weakness that it created in them of the fact that they were to be utterly dependent on God if they were to achieve his purposes. And yes, unusually in one sense, although circumcision normally would have been essentially a sign of identity and to a certain extent a sign of, of, of dependence, it wasn't normally a sign of mission purpose, but here it is. God has redeemed them from slavery in Egypt that they could come into the land promised by God to Abraham. That's, that's reference to again and again, the fact that they were to come into the land to fulfill promises of God, not just to them in redeeming them from Egypt, but the promises to God, of God to Abraham, to make of him a great nation through whom all nations will be blessed. And part of that purpose, as I've already referenced, as we look at chapter 6, is here in this particular situation to be agents of God's judgment. But once they are and established, they are to live as a nation under God who would be a witness to call all nations into a relationship with Yahweh. That's their ultimate purpose. Um, some of you have heard me say this one before, and I, I apologise if I say it again, but I think it, it, it absolutely sums it up. As the people were about to go into the promised land before Moses died, he gives them a reminder of all the laws of God and, and instructions in the book of Deuteronomy about how they're to live as a community that care for and provide for one another and includes the orphan and stranger amongst them in that provision. And he says to them, uh, to summarize something in chapter 4, uh, verses 8 and 9, my, my own paraphrase if you like, when you go into the land, keep my laws, keep God's laws, and when you do, the nations will look at you and say, wow, what a people, what a God, we want what they've got. That was Israel's purpose, that the nations would look at them and see something different and say, we want what they've got. In other words, a relationship with the living God that transforms the whole of life, not just personally, but community as well. And that's why they're actually now having to be circumcised because now they're no longer about to wander in the wilderness with no means of fulfilling that purpose. Now they're going to go into the promised land to be the people that God can use to call all nations to himself. So the circumcision here, and it's a sacred ritual that's, that's absolutely essential, that's at the very heart of their life, it's a sacred ritual that speaks of that sense of identity, of dependence, and ultimately of mission purpose. But then they're also going to celebrate another ritual, Passover, which is the sign of deliverance. Verses 10 to 12, we read of the, of the, of the celebration of the Passover. It's an unusual Passover because it doesn't involve any a, a lamb. All it involves is the grain and the food of the land. I wonder if you've got this picture in your mind of the people of God coming out of Egypt and coming out with loads of sheep and, and, and cattle and so on. Um, I know Cecil B. DeMille in, in, his, in, in some of his films has, has this sort of picture. Actually, it's not true. They came out of Egypt with nothing. And they went through 40 years in the wilderness with nothing. They had to depend 
as this, cha- as this chapter reminds us, they had to depend on God to provide them with manna and with quails and with water. That sheep and cattle and all the rest of it, they didn't need that provision, did they? They'd come through 40 years in the wilderness totally and utterly dependent on God. And so they have a Passover, yes, an odd Passover without a lamb. But in some way, it's still a Passover. We don't understand exactly what sort of Passover it would have been. Undoubtedly, it would have involved a recitation of the ritual. And there is a a, a very strong ritual behind the Passover to, to talk of what it means. And why were they doing it? Because finally, finally, they've come out of captivity into the real freedom that God had wanted them for. They're no longer to be under the domination of forces opposed to God, but they're now to be free in their own land to serve and love and worship the living God. And so this precious ritual of Passover is celebrated. And of course, as we know, that became an ongoing regular part of their life. Remembrance and reminder is absolutely essential if we are to keep a clear sense in our minds of who we are as God's people. And that's what I mean by sacred ritual. I don't mean just ritual for the sake of doing it. I mean that sense of sacred ritual where we do things because they're important to remind us of who we are and what we are and where we're going. And they celebrate Passover together And it's a Passover in which they're going to not only celebrate that they've come from captivity into freedom, but also it's a reminder that they've come from demanding slavery in Egypt through 40 years in the wilderness to a place where they can go into the promised land to enter into joyful obedience to God's word. Any nation needs laws in a community life if they're to be effective. Ten Commandments and the whole instruction about their community life, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy, is not meant to be a burden to the people. It's meant to be a sign and a gift of God's grace that says, right, now you're my people and I'm going to live in the midst of you and as you worship me, that's the first half of the Ten Commandments, as you worship me, then your personal life and your corporate life will be transformed so that you won't commit murder and you won't steal That's the second half of the Ten Commandments. Put like that, it has a different light, doesn't it? Know God and worship him and have our lives transformed. And and, and they share the Passover as a reminder that God has not only brought them out of of captivity to freedom, but out of slavery to sin, to a joyful obedience to the will and purposes of God. And those are important things for them to know who they are. But there's a couple of other important lessons that they've got to learn. And in verses 13 to 15, we have this, we have this story of Joshua standing near Jericho. I wonder what he was doing standing there near Jericho. I suspect probably it was the evening. Is he, is he pondering on what's going to come ahead, what they've got to do? Is he pondering on whether he's the right person to do it? We don't really know what's going on in Joshua's mind, but I suspect it was all of those things and perhaps more. And then he has this experience where he looks up and sees a man with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua finds himself in the presence of one who describes himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. Is this an angel? Is this Michael the archangel? Actually, I think it's someone even more important. In verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army, when, when, jo- when Joshua speaks to him, says, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. I believe Joshua has an experience, a vision of the living God. And he's got to learn the lesson of self-awareness. That's also so important then and now. Joshua is in the presence of a God 
who gives no answers to his questions, no explanations beyond the blank reminder that he is the commander, he is sovereign, not Joshua. Although Joshua is often described as the commander of, and the, and the, of, of the armies, actually all that Joshua is, and I think it's beautifully summed up in, in verse in verse uh, 14, where Joshua falls on his face to the ground in reverence. By the way, that's another indicator of this. It's not just an angel. If it was an angel, he would have been told to get up on his, off his feet, on his feet, because angels will not accept worship. But he falls on the ground in reverence and says, what message does my Lord have for his servant? That's self-awareness. It's the awareness to know that although God has called him to an incredible position of leadership amongst God's people, he, like them, is utterly dependent on the sovereign Lord God. And he can fall in worship and he can say, what have you got to say to me? And it's interesting, isn't it, that God doesn't actually have an answer really for him. His answer is take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. In other words, recognize who I am, who you are, and operate in that sense of self-awareness that enables him to operate in dependence on God, which gives him all the authority that he needs to lead God's people. And God's people were, had to have that same sense of self-awareness. And then finally, the final lesson that they had to learn together was the importance of community involvement. It was as individuals that the nation participated in these sacred rituals, yet they are also essential community activities. It's as a community together they share Passover, as they share in circumcision. So what's this got to say to us today? After all, this was 3,000 years ago. What's that got to do to, to, for us today? And I want to say I think there are incredible parallels here with where we stand now on the brink of moving into new expressions and understanding of God's purposes that are still rooted in the past. We're moving into new times with new opportunities. How long we will have those opportunities, I don't, hesit I don't, I don't profess to have any prophetic insight onto how long, but we have opportunities that have been absent from the church for many, many years. People are asking big questions in a way that they've not done for, for years about the meaning of life and the, and the sense of purpose and, and where it's all heading and so on. We have incredible opportunities, brothers and sisters, don't we? Yeah. And now is a time for us to take that. And now, therefore, is a time for us too to remind ourselves of those sacred rituals that speak of where we have come from, who we are, and where we're going. Baptism. Baptism, which speaks of God's deliverance of us as individuals, but also speaks of our identity together as the church, because we're baptized into Christ and we're baptized into the church. And baptism, in a sense, is, is the equivalent, well, Paul actually talks of it on occasions, as the equivalent of circumcision, doesn't he? a sacred ritual that we should really value for what it speaks to us of, that sense of deliverance and of freedom and of joyful obedience. You know, it's one of the paradoxes, isn't it? And Paul uses it in Romans 6. He talks of the fact that we're slaves of sin until we come to faith in Christ. And, then, and it, it's in the chapter in which he starts by talking about because of your baptism, then, then you ought to be living as free people. You were buried. You've been raised to new life. And then he goes on to talk about the fact, and of course, that means now you become slaves of righteousness. How can I be set free if I'm becoming a slave again? It's quite simple, actually. Baptism reminds us that we've been buried with Christ. We've been raised with him into a new life. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit, which means now that instead of being slaves to sin and never being able to fully achieve what God wants in us, we have now got the freedom and the power if we choose to be obedient to actually do what God wants. Yeah. 
And that's who we are. And baptism is so important in reminding us of that. And therefore, it's not something to be treated lightly, it's something to be valued and celebrated. And the Eucharist, and I, I deliberately choose that word because it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a biblical word. Eucharist, thanksgiving, communion. That's a parallel to Passover. And both of those have the same message and the same symbolism in the sense. Both are reminders of the importance of community involvement. We've already said, as you're baptised into Christ, you're also baptised into the church. When, when, we take, when, we, when we share bread and wine together, we're redeemed as individuals, in a sense, by the blood of the sacrifice of Christ, but we're one body through Christ's death. God has called us to be a community together, not just a collection of individuals, nor simply people who meet together on Zoom or live streaming. And I think that's why it's so important that as we, as we face the future with all its challenges and opportunities, we not only are fully aware of and value that sense of sacred ritual that speaks of who we are and what we are and what God's purposes are for us, but we have that sense that we, we are a community together with an awareness that God is amongst us, with an awareness that it's he that will do the great and mighty things as we walk in obedience with him. I believe that the importance of treating the return to community life is an absolute priority. Personal testimony is great, but the testimony of the gathered church living in community is even more powerful. If you doubt that, read the early chapters of the book of Acts and see what the community achieved. The presence of God is everything. But that doesn't mean we're nothing. We need that sense of self-awareness of who God is and who we are in that sense of relationship to him. Merely servants, but actually merely is a, is a wrong word. Servants is a privileged position. As a chosen, redeemed, sanctified people, as servants and participants in God's purposes, we are loved beyond measure, treasured beyond price in God's heart. That's why we have those sacred rituals of baptism and Eucharist. That's why we meet together as God's people. Whether it be as a whole church to worship, whether it be in smaller groups such as Bible study or house groups, let's treasure them. Let's value them, both the rituals and the community. Let's contribute to them and continually draw confidence from them. God's promised his presence with us through his Holy Spirit, hasn't he? And he longs to use us to break the chains of captivity of sin, to sin. Yes, he does call us to speak of and warn of judgment. We aren't the tools of judgment, but we are to speak and warn of judgment so that we might bring sight to the spiritually blind and enable God to break the chains of captivity to sin, assured of his presence and the privilege of a vital part in his purposes. Let's go, knowing who we are, what we are, expecting to see lives transformed and people added to the kingdom. And in a sense, what better way to start than joining Jill and Roger's house group in the prayer walk on Friday evening, eh? Wouldn't that be a good place to start? As community together, confident in who we are and what we are, certain of our purpose and assured of the message that God gives us of new life in Christ for all who will turn in repentance and faith and believing that God by his Holy Spirit will work that in people's lives. I pray this morning that we really do grasp, that we value those sacred rituals that God has given us to remind us of who we are and of what we are and where we're going. I want us to close with a song.
Some of you may know it, some of you may not. Many of you, if you do know it, will think of it as a children's song. But I've referred to this before, and i just read it now. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 7, Moses reminds the people of God, the Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you, choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. And in love, God has redeemed us from the power of sin and Satan and evil. We have a special place in his heart. We're not special for any other reason than the fact that God has loved us and has chosen us in Christ from before the foundation of the world and has purpose that we should be the means of bringing the witness and the possibility of reconciliation with God to all, all men. Hallelujah. And that's why I want to close with this. Yes, it could be seen as a children's song. I hope you know it. I'm special because God has loved me. Who knows that? A uh, few of you do. Good. Good. I'm special. And I, I believe God really wants us this morning to go out with that sense of, yes, that self-awareness that he is sovereign. But we are special because he's loved us and chosen us and wants to equip us by his spirit and enable us to be the people that he wants us to be. So what better way to go out than actually saying yes, isn't it? Yes, I'm going to go out knowing that I'm special. And thank you, Jesus, that you love me because I didn't deserve it, but you chose me to do it. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's close with that song.